Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, this event about Feed the Future and the work we are doing uh, together. I am delighted to uh, be here with uh, someone whom I admire so much and am uh, very enthusiastic about, and that is uh, President Joyce Banda from Malawi. Thank you so much, my friend. And I want to thank uh, Nick Kristoff, who will moderate uh, the discussion this morning, but I'm not thanking him for that. I want to thank him for covering all of those incredibly important issues, uh, whether it's feed the future and increasing agricultural productivity, but as a, farmer, a former farm boy, he understands and appreciates that, or emphasizing human trafficking, as he did again uh, in uh, reporting on the President's uh, historic speech at the Clinton Global Initiative. Uh, Nick had a, had a column about Feed the Future, and I, I can't remember the exact title, but it was something like the most boring program you've never heard of that's making a difference. Uh, and so, Nick, thank you for staying the course with us and being uh, uh, swimming against the tide. You know, there are headlines and there are trend lines, and sometimes we confuse the two. And oftentimes, we neglect the trend lines for the headlines. And uh, Nick hasn't done that, and we're very grateful uh, to you. I also want to thank our partners uh, from uh, Burkina Faso who are here, including the foreign minister. Thank you, thank you sir, for uh, being here. Uh, I also want to uh, thank the Minister of External Affairs from Sri Lanka. Thank you for being with us. Uh, and the Minister of Agriculture and Water Resources from Burkina Faso. Um, I want to acknowledge Dr. Raj Shah, the uh, USAID administrator, who has been hands-on and pushing forward on so many of the changes that we are uh, bringing about. I want to thank uh, my chief of staff and counselor, Cheryl Mills, who's been one of the driving uh, forces behind uh, what the United States has done. Uh, and I want to thank the director general of the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, who is also here. Thank you. Now, you will get to hear more from uh, a lot of these people. Um, and a person that you just heard that you may not have known you were listening to who narrated the video, uh, Matt Damon. And I want to thank Matt for once again uh, lending his talent to helping us um, highlight uh, this important issue. Now, this is the fourth time that we have uh, gathered on the margins of the UN General Assembly to focus the world's attention on food security. In 2009, we reaffirmed the principles reflected in the L'Aquila Food Security Initiative, the international community's $22 billion pledge to support agricultural development worldwide, including President Obama's pledge of $3.5 billion through what we were beginning to call our Feed the Future Initiative for Global Hunger and Food Security. In 2010, I launched the 1,000 Days Partnership with Ireland, uh, the United Nations, and other international partners to improve nutrition from pregnancy through a child's second birthday, which is critical for lifelong health and development. And then last year, we focused on supporting women in agriculture because women often do the work at every link of the agricultural chain. They grow the food, they store it, they sell it, and they prepare it. So we must ensure that women get the support they need if we are serious about improving uh, food security. As a result of all the work of so many people over the last four years, uh, food security is now at the top of our national and foreign policy agendas, as well as that of so many other nations in the world, because we understand it is a humanitarian and moral imperative, but it also directly relates to global security and stability. I've seen in my travels how increased investments in agriculture and nutrition are paying off in rising prosperity, healthier children, better markets, and stronger communities. So we meet here today knowing that progress is possible, is taking place. But I want to say a few words about our civil society partners, because along with the private sector, which already is giving unprecedented support to agricultural development in Africa, 
and now through our new alliance for food security and nutrition, are really increasing their investment and their collaboration. But civil society organizations are crucial to our success in both the public and the private sector. They have long-standing uh, relationships in communities and valuable technical expertise, and they work every single day on their commitment to try to make the world a better place for all of us. So today, I am pleased to announce a new commitment by civil society groups. Interaction, an alliance of 198 U.S.-based organizations, and Sam Worthington, its uh, president, is here today, is pledging more than one billion dollars of private non-governmental funds over the next three years to improve food security and nutrition worldwide. <laughs> of this one billion dollars, five U.S.-based organizations together have pledged to invest more than $900 million in this effort. They are World Vision, Heifer International, Catholic Relief Services, Save the Children, and Child Fund International. Let's give all five of these great organizations a round of applause. And just as these organizations hold governments accountable, they have agreed to be held accountable themselves. Starting in 2013, Interaction will make annual reports here at the UN General Assembly on its commitments and disbursements worldwide. And I am so grateful to Interaction and its members for their outstanding support and generosity. Let's keep in mind the principles that guide us. This week at the UN General Assembly, developing and developed countries together are emphasizing what we know to be true. Country ownership is critical to successful development. When developing countries themselves are in the lead, when programs are designed for their specific strengths and needs, when we work together to build capacity at the local level that can carry progress forward independently, and when new resources are brought to the table in a transparent, collaborative manner, that is the best strategy for achieving concrete, sustainable results. These commitments by civil society reflect this approach, and we all need to rededicate ourselves to it, not only in global food security, but more broadly, as we work to achieve the Millennium Development Goals and look beyond those deadlines to our long-term development work. I think we are on the right track, so we just have to keep pushing forward. Now, this will be my last time chairing this meeting. Uh, a year from now, I will be a private citizen again. But I want to take this opportunity to uh, say to all of you how personally gratifying this work has been for me. Uh, as Secretary of State and as uh, an old uh, NGO activist myself, going back more years than I care to remember, I have so believe in it and I am so grateful to all of you who have devoted your time and energy and resources to this shared mission. Now let me recognize and introduce someone who I have uh, a great uh, um, admiration for and someone who's been an inspirational leader uh, to all those who work on food security worldwide. Uh, she started her own civil society organizations in uh, Malawi, and I was so pleased to uh, be able to visit her uh, a short time ago and, and see the progress she's making, hear more about her plans, go out and visit some women uh, in a dairy cooperative, uh, deliver a big bull to them, uh, which, uh, you know, had all kinds of uh, double meanings, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it, uh, it, seemed to, uh, it seemed to be the right thing to do. And uh, I am uh, delighted that we're going to have a conversation uh, with uh, uh, Nick. And so, uh, Nick Kristoff, please kick it off. Thanks very much. And um, let me just say that there's also, I think, a larger significance to this than just the 
the, the content of the discussion. It, it really is, it seems to me, kind of remarkable that during the busiest diplomatic uh, week of the, of the annual calendar that we should be having this conversation not about those issues in the headlines, as you said, but about the trend lines, about, some of the, about how to address the needs of some of the world's most vulnerable people. And thanks to both of you for, uh, for, for hosting this event uh, in that sense. Um, President Bonda, let me ask you a question uh, for starters. We're focusing today in part on the power of civil society. You very much emerged from civil society. That was where your career came from. And since you became president, I've heard little scattered bits and pieces about, about your career origins, and I think it had something to do at some point with going to a USAID office. And in journalism, we have, a, we have an expression that some stories are too good to check. Um, <laughs> and so I'm a little nervous to ask you. Maybe it'll be more banal than that. But can you tell us a little bit about how you did come to uh, emerge as a civil society player before you became president? Thank you very much, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to share this podium with a very good old friend and a friend of Africa. I start my story from being married early, spending 10 years in an abusive marriage, and then later on going shopping again and finding a better husband. <laughs> It was very clear in my mind at that point that I think what had gone wrong is that I was not prepared for marriage and I was not economically empowered. So having corrected that bit of my own life with great risk, it almost killed my mom. I began to look back and wondered what was happening to most of those women who were locked up in abusive situations but didn't have the courage to walk out. Because socially as an African woman, you need to you want to remain married, because that's the right thing to do. You don't walk away from an abusive relationship. It doesn't make sense. So you stick there. But I walked out. What was happening to the rest of the women who would wish to walk out but couldn't? As I was being bothered by these thoughts, at that point I was economically empowered myself, running one of the largest uh, uh, industrial garment manufacturing industries owned by a woman in that country employing hundreds of people, I started to worry about my fellow women. And that's when USID came on the scene. So I remember attending a, an event organized by UNDP, looking at why Malawi's private sector wasn't growing and why wasn't it being regarded as the engine for growth. And I remember standing up at, a meeting, at that meeting, I was one of only two women and saying, well, as long as women are sidelined, there's no way this country is going to move from where it is. Women have to get to the table. And, uh, and it was during the dictatorship, so you, freedom of speech didn't exist at that time. So I remember at break time, a tall American guy walked over to me and said, are you not worried about making such statements in public? Don't you know what can happen to you? Because those days you went to jail for nothing. And I said, well, it doesn't matter. But somebody has to say it. Somebody has to do it. And he pulled out a card and told me that if in the future you ever want support, here is my card. I looked at the card. It said USID project, RAID project, Rural Enterprise Development. And uh, three women who were in business were looking for ways of coming to the U.S. for a study tour, and USID supported me, sponsored the three of us. And uh, we got here and were hosted by African American Institute. It was during that trip, while I was still worried about what is it that I can do back home, and was provided with an opportunity by USID to interact with women's groups in this country, that it became very clear in my mind that I needed to get back home and organize a group of women and act as a pressure group to, to press for equal opportunities for women in business. At that moment, I thought I was just uh, f forming a club. It was going to be 100 women here and there. 
So I went back home. But so many things happened, and I would spend the whole day explaining. But when I, I remember going back home and phoning Carol Peasley, who was then the country director of USID, and said, well, you started it. You sponsored me to go to, a, to the US, and I'm back. Now I want to organize women. And how can you support me? And she said, well, what is, what is the matter with women? What's, what's going on? And the three sentences into my presentation, she folded her pad and put her pen away, and I knew that I had succeeded in making a total fool of myself. <laughs> and so I had to start all over again. So I went back to her, and uh, I realized that I didn't have my figures right. I didn't done the proper checking. No data had been collected, needs assessment survey. So that whole process, I went back to Carol, and that is what USID did for us. I formed the National Association of Business Women. And of course, there were some times that I was confronted with a near arrest, and I remember once or twice running back to USID to hide in the USID headquarters. So uh, last time when I came, I said, well, I'm a product of USID, and somebody said, how come? But there's so much that we can talk about, and I thought that I should start by expressing that gratitude, that uh, all along the way, the first office that we opened in Malawi, the first group of women that we mobilized, the first cars that we had, institutional development grant, everything was provided by USID. Wow. Raj, you've got to find that uh, person and give her a raise. <laughs> Secretary Clinton, now, the traditional approach uh, of foreign assistance largely involved writing big checks from a distance. And now we're evolving to something that is much more based on public-private partnerships, on working with civil society, on bringing a larger community together. Why that change? Well, well I think we just heard uh, a description of why that change. Um, empowering local people by giving them the tools to start their own organizations, find their own voices, uh, run their own programs, which is what uh, the president has done, uh, is a much more effective, sustainable uh, kind of development assistance. Moving from aid to trade so that we really help people um, develop businesses, which then in turn can employ local people and open markets, is a much more effective uh, form of development assistance. Putting the country and the community in charge of setting the priorities. So it's not our priorities sitting in Washington or New York or anywhere else other than on the ground in the places that are going to make the decisions whether or not what is being provided has staying power. And I think, Nick, that it, the United States has been, both through our government and particularly through uh, philanthropy, NGOs, our faith communities, has been extraordinarily generous uh, and has helped so many people over so many years with immediate humanitarian uh, crises that had to be addressed in the here and now. Uh, but over the last several years, and as someone who's been doing this for a very long time, it became clearer and clearer that what we really wanted to do was work ourselves out of the business of development, but, <clears throat> but for those crises that overwhelmed any country, the earthquake in, in Haiti, something that was just impossible uh, for any country to respond to. And so we have consciously in this administration and certainly working in collaboration uh, with AID and with uh, the private uh, and uh, not-for-profit sectors, we've been very focused on that. I went to Busan, South Korea, and made a speech about how we had to put country ownership in the lead. It was and remains controversial in some areas uh, because it really calls upon those of us who are writing the checks and you know, doling out uh, the support to be a little more humble and a little more uh, receptive to hearing, not just talking, uh, about what we're trying to accomplish together. Uh, so Feed the Future, of course, is backed with enormous amounts of investment from 
um, governments, private sectors, not-for-profit, and then with this excellent announcement today about uh, interaction in our, our five um, organizations, we, we are still very much in uh, the, uh, the lead in providing funding, but everything we're trying to do now is to build capacity. So uh, the final thing I would say is like one of the great uh, programs the United States uh, ran was PEPFAR, something that has made such a difference in providing a uh, AIDS drugs and treatment. But we realized in this administration, we had to also help build health systems uh, because if all we were was a drug dispensary, then when the drugs stopped, maybe the countries would not be able to continue providing what uh, their um, patient populations needed. So we're working with countries like South Africa and others uh, to help them make the transition, and we're gonna do more to help them have systematic uh, foundational support. Uh, so I, I think it's uh, it's something that's very exciting in development, especially for some of us who have, you know, been uh, doing this for a while, to see leaders like uh, the president step forward and say, look, I was in civil society. I'm now in government. I think we know what our priorities should be. So align what you're giving us with what our priorities are for the long term. But Secretary Clinton, I'm, I'm sure there are some NGOs out there and they're thinking about their field offices where you know the photocopier doesn't work and the the car is leaking oil and they're thinking you know you represent this incredible government with these astounding resources that seems to do anything and what extra benefit do those NGOs or do, do does civil society bring you why in a sense why do you need them given their photocopiers don't work and their cars don't work and everything else well, because we believe in collaboration and the kind of partnership that we want uh, with governments and NGOs and others uh, is indispensable to our overall goals. Uh, there are civil society groups and organizations, some of them just very, very small on the ground without uh, the photocopier working, and then there are multi-million dollar enterprises with very new cars and lots of photocopiers. Um, and at all levels, what we're looking for is what's the value added. And as Joyce was just talking about, an AID uh, you know, uh, representative in Malawi uh, could be providing all kinds of ideas uh, for her as she began searching for a way to organize. And then maybe, uh, there's an NGO, an American or international NGO, uh, that has done this work. And so they're down the, the road, and they can provide some additional value. But if all of us have the mindset shift that we are now going to be guided by what the Joyce Bandas of the world want, not the Hillary Clintons or the Raj Shahs, we then will facilitate, catalyze, leverage, support people like Joyce and governments like hers in achieving the uh, progress that they're seeking. So there's a, this is a big playing field. There's room for so many different individuals and groups. But what we're trying to do is knit together an overall shift in attitude among the aid givers to be very respectful of those who are on the receiving end so that they are feeling empowered to build on the progress that is being made. And In addition, uh, I would like to add to what uh, Secretary Clinton just said, that uh, at the point when I started the National Association of Business Women, USID had established in Malawi what they called the shared project. And through the shared project, the civil society could go and uh, seek support, financial support, institutional capacity support, program support, and the, I think we went from maybe 10 NGOs to 400 NGOs because of that opportunity. The National Association of Business Women uh, in, in a period of seven months, I mean seven years, reached out to 50,000 women. Now all the organizations that I have founded, it is now a total of 1.1 million beneficiaries. Now when you look back, if it hadn't been for the intervention or the support provided by USID in the first place, some of us would not have done as much as we have been able to do. And President Banda, I mean, I think one of the 
lessons learned from the past 50 years. One of the mistakes that we in the West have made is that we've often had a bunch of really smart Americans sitting around a conference room and come up with great ideas, but haven't listened enough to civil society like that. And I think there's often a frustration from those groups about, about that fact. So, you know, you, you have the microphone. What do we Americans need to learn from African civil society? What, what message do we need to get better? Listen. Listen. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I've always said that we know exactly what we want to do. We know how to move from point A to point B. I knew from a very young age, as I've said, what I needed to do to empower fellow women. What we're looking for is partnership. And that is what we're finding. Just this week, we signed an MOU with the Clinton Development Initiative. Why? Because I'm satisfied it's going to be a partnership. Be organizations that come into Africa and recognize that there's leadership in Africa and respect us and know that we want to achieve what we want to achieve with dignity. So they don't come and impose themselves upon us. It really does break my heart when uh, large NGO civil society organizations come to Africa, believe that they can do it alone, then they waste so much money. 20 years later they leave and they say, you know Africans, we've been trying. They can't be assisted. But it's because they did it wrong, they didn't listen to us. Well, there are so many Joyce Banders where I come from. Nick, could I, could I just add on to what Joyce has said? Because this is really the heart of what we've tried to do in the last four years. And it comes from our own recognition that um, we, we've done a lot of very good things. But I think the impact and the lasting sustainability of a lot of what we've done could certainly have been enhanced if what we were doing had been embedded more in civil society, more in government ministries. And yes, that's, that's a risk. Not doing it is a risk. Uh, and I'd rather take the risk on that side. I, I remember being in a refugee camp and I was wandering around as you do when you make these visits and I was talking to some of the people and uh, some of the women were telling me that uh, they were still afraid to go out and collect firewood. Um, some of their babies had diarrhea. And this was in a camp run by a very good consortium of international NGOs and government-funded development agencies. Um, and one woman said to me, who can I get to listen to me about what we need? And, and, and it's just when you're, when you're focused on what you think of as the emergency, you get really busy and it's easy to shut your ears because you just don't have time to stop and listen. And yet what I was being told in a short visit, because people were coming to me almost out of desperation, uh, was something that wasn't new, but it just hadn't been heard. So, and I think that's a really important point of Joyce's. Those of us who, are, who do this work in whatever capacity, you got, you know, you always have to be asking yourself, is, is this really serving the way that I wish to serve to help people or not? And listen, listen, listen. If nothing else is taken away from this morning, I think President Banda's uh, admonition is really important. Well, we're going to uh, adhere to that admonition because in a moment we're going to have another uh, panel precisely listening to uh, civil society. But we're out of time for this panel, so please join me in uh, thanking President Bonta and Secretary Clinton for their participation, for hosting this event. Thank you.